All right. Are we ready for the word of the Lord this morning? Uh, I'm going to be reading a large chunk of scripture because I'm starting a new series today Mm. called Jesus the Sower. Mm. Jesus the Sower. And this is going to be a four-part series. And uh, part one is today. Let me stop this so I stop getting text messages. Um, Part one is today, and I'm going to be reading this passage every week. This is an incredibly important passage. Uh, Jesus is giving us the parable of the sower. This is perhaps his most famous parable, and it's almost certainly his most important parable. And we're going to see why in a moment. Mark chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 1 through 20. Here we go. And again, he began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, sorry, where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable, and he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Father, I pray today that you would speak to us by the power of your word and spirit, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, and open our eyes. We pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Lord, just remove all distractions right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 encapsulates the entire ministry of Jesus. Mark 1, 14 and 15 says, After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of God. And that gospel that he preached had three components. First, an announcement. The time has come, he said. Then an explanation. The kingdom of God is here. And then an invitation. Repent and believe the gospel. The announcement, the time has come. The explanation, what time has come? The kingdom of God is here. Time for the kingdom. 
And then number three, the invitation. How do we respond? How do we enter in? Repent and believe the gospel. Yeah. And so the burden of the ministry of Jesus was the kingdom of God, mm. announcing the kingdom, explaining the kingdom, and inviting us to come into the kingdom. Yeah. And everything that Jesus said and did after this first sermon that he preached here in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, was an explanation of this announcement, of this explanation, and of this invitation. Everything that he said and did simply further extrapolated for us, restated for us this announcement, this explanation, and this invitation. Now, Jesus had two primary means of furthering this announcement, this explanation, and this invitation. The first primary mean was working miracles and casting out demons. By working miracles and casting out demons, he was actually making an announcement. He was actually providing a visual explanation, and he was actually inviting us into the kingdom. Now, the second primary method was his teaching. In his teaching, he was announcing the kingdom, he was explaining the kingdom, and he was inviting us explicitly to come into the kingdom. Now, when you look at the teaching of Jesus, 60% of his teaching takes the form of parables. His most important and favorite teaching tool was the parable. 60% of his teaching was parables. He loved parables, and people loved to hear his parables. Jesus would, would, would drop a parable on you in a second. Now, the, the word parable, para, parabalain, literally means to throw one thing down next to another to throw one thing down next to another. What Jesus would literally do is he would take an earthly story, something that we all understood, and throw it down next to a heavenly truth, something that we don't understand. Yeah. So all of his parables had the same function. Yeah. I'm going to take something that you do understand yeah. and try to use it to reveal to you something that you don't understand. Yeah. I'm going to take an earthly story and use it to reveal a heavenly truth. Now, he was doing the same thing with his miracles, actually. He would take a need that you did understand, like pain in your body or sickness in your body, and he would heal that need as a way of revealing to you a need that you did not understand. He was trying to reveal a heavenly need, and he did so by healing an earthly need. He was trying to reveal to you that he wanted to provide something to you from heaven, and so he did so by touching and remedying something on the earth. The problem was that the majority of people, both the people who heard his teachings and the people who received his miracles, never actually got to the heavenly truth, never actually got to the heavenly need. They were simply satisfied with the earthly story or the meeting of the earthly need. Now we see that in John chapter 6 when he takes the bread and the fish and he feeds the 5,000 and then he gets to the boat and go, gets on the boat and goes to the other side of the lake and the crowd wakes up in the morning and he's gone and they follow him to the other side of the lake and they say, where did you go? And he says, surely I say unto you, you followed me not because you saw signs, but because you ate bread and are full. Yeah. Literally, Jesus says, the only reason you're here is because you liked the bread and the fish, yeah. but you missed the fact that the bread and the fish were a sign. Yeah. I met an earthly need to reveal to you that you have a heavenly need. And they're like, what are you talking about? He says, okay, you want the heavenly need? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my body, you can have, and, I'm sorry, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you can have no part of me. What he was trying to reveal to them is that they actually needed something deeper and that in meeting the earthly need, he was offering, he was inviting them to open their eyes yeah. to the heavenly need. Yeah. And in telling them the earthly story, he's inviting them to open their eyes to the heavenly truth. Yes. And so Jesus tells this parable to the crowd, to the multitude, and, and they didn't get it. He says, a sower went out to sow. And as he scattered seed, some seed fell on the wayside, and the birds came down and devoured it. And other seed fell on stony ground, and it, it, it had, there wasn't much earth there. It didn't have much root, and so it sprang up quickly, but as soon as the sun shone down on it, it scorched it, and it was withered. But other seed fell among thorns, and it started to grow, and you thought you are going to have a beautiful crop, but just before it produced fruit, the thorns wrapped around it and strangled it so that it became unfruitful. But some fell on good ground and produced a crop, some 30, 60, and 100 fold. Let him who has an ear, let him hear. See you later. And then he turned and left. Peace. He peaced out of there, right? 
Now, here's the crazy thing. You know, a lot of people get tripped up on this because now the disciples follow him into the house and they ask him, what's the meaning of this parable? And he says to them, to you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to the crowds I speak in parables so that seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand. Yeah. And it seems like God is saying, it seems like Jesus is saying, I don't want them to understand. I don't want them to get it. I only want you to get it. But here's the, the crazy thing. The disciples were in the crowd when Jesus gave this parable, and they didn't get it either. It wasn't like there was an elite group of Christians who got it, yeah. and then the masses of ignorant people who didn't get it. It's, it. His message is not elitism. Do you know the only difference between the disciples and the crowds? The disciples were willing to follow Jesus into the house and ask him what it meant. That is, the disciples were just as confused as everyone else. The only difference between them is that they were willing to come into the house and ask him for understanding. The crowds heard and said, wow, that's cool, that's good, but they went home without understanding. But the disciples heard, and if they didn't give it, get it, they followed Jesus home, and they said, Lord, you've got to give us understanding because we heard, but we didn't get it. We want to get it. Please give us understanding. Jesus reveals himself not to the casual observer, but to those who follow him home into the house and ask for understanding. And when was the last time after a service was over when you heard a word from the Lord and you knew something was there, but you didn't quite get it? When was the last time you went into your prayer closet, you opened up your Bible and you begged God to give you understanding? If you want understanding, you've got to ask him. Wow. That's Proverbs chapter two. My son, if you would receive my words and hide my commands within you, inclining your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest out after knowledge, if thou liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest them as silver and searchest for them as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. God is looking for hearts that seek him as for hidden treasures, that seek him as silver and search for him as for hidden treasures. You see, it's not enough to hear. Jesus is not, when Jesus says, let him who has an ear, let him hear, he's literally saying, repent and believe the gospel. This is the restatement of his invitation to enter the kingdom. Yeah. Jesus told some 37 parables. And all of these parables are found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 37 parables. Mm. And of those 37 parables, I say that this is the most important parable. And why do I say this is the most important parable? Because when Jesus comes into the house and the disciples follow him there, and they ask him, can you please explain this parable to us? Can you please give us understanding because we don't get it? He says to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Yeah. Translation, if you don't get this one, you ain't going to get any of them. It's no wonder you don't understand the parable of the pearl of great price or the treasure hidden in a field. The man who found the treasure in the field and when he found it for his joy, he went and sold all he had, came back and bought that field. If you don't get this parable, of course, you don't get the parable of the good Samaritan who found the man in the ditch and he, he picked him up and put him on his own donkey and took him to the inn and, and poured oil in his wounds and paid for his expenses. If you don't get this parable, of course you're not going to get the parable of the, the, the ten virgins, the five foolish and the five wise virgins the virgins who had oil in their lamp and the ones who didn't have oil in their lamp. If you don't get this parable, you're not going to get any of the parables. Yeah. But the opposite is also true. But if you get this parable, you can get all the parables. Wow. This parable is the key to understanding all the parables. And by extension, I can say that understanding all of the parables is the key to understanding the totality of the teaching of Jesus because his primary teaching tool was the parables. And a great discipleship course that you could do all by yourself is learn all 37 of those parables and ask God for understanding. But the key to that is to getting this parable. So Jesus says, huh. by the way, this parable and all the parables, the burden of them is the kingdom of God. I have to say this before I go on. The burden of all of the parables of Jesus is the kingdom of God. At the heart of the ministry of Jesus is not just announcing that the kingdom of here is here and not just explaining what the kingdom is like, 
but inviting us to come in to the kingdom of God. In every single one of the parables, he's inviting us to come in to the kingdom of God. He's announcing the kingdom, explaining the kingdom, and inviting us to come in to the kingdom of God. And at, the, at, at its very heart, the kingdom of God is the place where God is completely free to reveal to us all of his love, all of his power, yeah. all of his glory, yeah. all of his blessing, and all of his goodness because our hearts are completely surrendered, devoted to him, and enraptured by him. I'm going to say that again because you've got to get this. The kingdom of God is the place where God is completely free to reveal to us wow. all of his power, all of his glory, all of his love, all of his blessing, all of his favor, and all of his goodness. And he can reveal those things to us because our hearts are completely surrendered, completely devoted to him, and completely enraptured by him. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. When our hearts are completely surrendered to God, when our hearts are completely devoted to God, when our hearts are completely enraptured by God, God becomes completely free to reveal to us all of his love, all of his power, all of his glory, all of his goodness, all of his kindness, all of his grace, all of his blessing, all of his favor. He is able, listen, God desires to reveal all of those things to us, but he cannot until our hearts are completely surrendered. And to the degree that our hearts surrender and devote to him and are enraptured by him, to that degree he reveals those things to us. So when we're talking about the vision of this house, the vision of Lineage Church as God truly among us, that's what I'm talking about, life in the kingdom. Because that's what Jesus was talking about. Jesus invited us into a place to live in a place where God is completely free to reveal to us all of his love and power and glory because our hearts are completely surrendered and devoted to him and enraptured by him. That is God truly among us. When we're talking about having an encounter with God, we tend to think of the form of that encounter instead of the content of it. The form of it is sometimes you fall to the floor. The form of it is sometimes you feel woozy. The form of it is sometimes you get goosebumps and bubblies. The form of it is, is sometimes you shake and cry. That's, that's form, but who cares about form? What I care about is content. Yeah. The content of it is a completely surrendered heart. As I talked about last Sunday, when your heart gives God, it's forever yes. That is a completely surrendered heart. That is a completely devoted heart. That is a completely enraptured heart. And in that place, all of the sudden, God is completely free to reveal all of his power and glory and love and favor and blessing. And so if you're crying out for more of God's power, favor, and glory and blessing, he's crying out for more surrender from you. He's crying out for the devotion of your heart. And when we enter into that place, God is free to reveal these things to us. And this is encounter with God. This is what we mean by encounter with God. Your life begins to change. The crooked places are made straight in your heart as we come into an encounter with God. But if we wish to pursue encounter with God, yeah. we must come into the kingdom. Yeah. Because the crooked places straight are only, the crooked places are only made straight mm. in the kingdom. Yeah. You gotta be living in the kingdom. And this is how Jesus came. And this is why he came to invite us to live into this, in this kingdom. Wow. But here's the meaning of this parable. When you look at this parable, there's three components that you have to understand. One key for understanding any passage of scripture is to identify the key words or the key concepts or the key images. Yeah. And then if you can understand those key words, concepts, and images, you can understand the passage as a whole. And in every passage of scripture, there's one, two, or three key words, concepts, or images. And if you can identify them, that's, that's the interpretive skill. And in the parable of the sower, there's three images. The first is the sower. The second is the soil. I'm sorry, the first is the sower. The second is the seed. And the third is the soil. The sower, the seed, and the soil. If you want to understand this parable, you've got to know who the sower is. And if you want to understand this parable, you've got to know what the seed is. Yeah. And if you want to understand this parable, you've got to know what the soil is. Yeah. The sower, the seed, mm. and the soil. Yeah. They didn't understand who the sower was. They didn't understand what the seed was. And they didn't understand what the soil was. And that's why they didn't understand the parable. And so when they came to Jesus in the inner room, that's what they asked him. 
So Jesus begins his explanation in Mark chapter 4, verse 14, by saying, he actually answers the first two in one verse. The sower sows the word. The sower sows the word. He says, you want to know who the sower is? The sower is the one who sows the word. Well, once he revealed to them that the seed is the word, then that immediately explained to us who the sower is. Because who's the one who sows the word? Jesus himself. Jesus himself. The parable of the sower is literally about Jesus himself. He is the subject of this parable. He's literally telling us about himself, but in a roundabout way. Isn't it interesting that he's literally telling the crowd who he is, but they don't get it because they don't ask. Jesus can literally explain to us who he is, reveal to us who he is, but we don't get it because we don't ask. Jesus literally says, I'm the sower. And that's interesting because we tend to know Jesus and identify Jesus in a multitude of ways, and the sower is not one of them. We know him as the Savior. We know him as the Lord. We know him as the King. We know him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We know him as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. We know him as the captain of our salvation. We know him as the living word. We know him in all of these ways. But in this series, beginning today, I want to introduce you to Jesus, the sower. I want you to know him as the sower. Jesus is inviting us to know him in a new way as Jesus, the sower. The one who sows. Now, that word sower is not a word that's commonly used in the English language, in our modern day English language. We don't use the word sower. The closest thing to it would be the farmer. Jesus the farmer. But that's not exactly accurate either because sowing was only one function of farming. You see, in the ancient world, once a year, the farmer became the sower. Once a year, after the ground was cultivated, last year's crop had already been harvested and the ground was let, lay, allowed to lay fallow for a season and then it was cultivated and it was tilled and, and it was plowed and, and it was watered and, and now the ground is ready to receive the seed. At that moment, the farmer took on the role of the sower and he would take his basket of seed and he would go out and just begin to scatter seed everywhere. Just scatter seed everywhere, everywhere. Scatter seed everywhere. But Jesus is saying that being the sower is not a once a year ministry for me. It's my perpetual task. Literally for three years, Jesus went all over ancient Israel scattering seed. Everywhere he went, he had a basket of seed and he was scattering seed. Literally, when he says the sower sows the word, what he's telling his disciples is, this is what I've been doing all this time. It's the only thing I do. And it's the only thing I'm going to do all the way up to my cross. The, the, the day I die, I'm just going to sow seed. I'm going to sow seed. The sower sows the word. If you want to understand the function of Jesus in your heart, he comes to you as the sower, the one who's sowing seed of the word of God. He's sowing the seed of the word of God. And literally, the entire message of this parable is this, that the word of Jesus alone is sufficient to bring you into the kingdom, to break off every power of darkness from your life, to cleanse every power of sin, to reveal to you the mysteries of the kingdom, to bring you before the face of God, to establish you in right relationship with God, to cause you to become a child of God, to empower you with the Spirit of God, and to cause you to live in right relationship with God for the rest of your life. His word is enough for that. And so if you're crying out for any of those things and you think you need something other than the word of Jesus, you've completely missed it. We cry out for deliverance, not realizing that the word is sufficient for deliverance, as if there's some power of God other than the word of Jesus that is able to bring us deliverance because the word of Jesus comes in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is our source of deliverance. But here's the clear message of the parable. 
this word of Jesus only activates in our hearts to do those things if it is allowed to dwell there undisturbed. The whole message of the parable is this. I'm sowing the word everywhere, and there's nothing wrong with the sower, and there's nothing wrong with the seed. The problem is the soil. Because notice, he explains the sower and the seed in one verse, and not only one verse, one short verse, which consists of one short sentence. The sower sows the seed. That's it. That's all he says about that. There's no problem with the sower. You don't need the sower to be any different. You don't need the seed to be any different. So if something doesn't bear fruit in your life, it's not because you didn't get the right sower and it's not because you didn't get the right kind of seed. If the sower is Jesus and the seed came from him, you got the right seed. The problem is the soil. And the, the, the totality of the majority of this parable is not about the sower and not about the seed, but about the soil. That the clear message of this parable is this. If you are living a life of separation from the living power and blessing and presence and favor and love of God, it's because there's something wrong with your soil. If you are not encountering God in powerful ways, something's wrong with the soil. Let him who has ear, let him hear. You've got to get your soil right. The word of Jesus is enough, but you've got to get your soil right. You see, many of you, most of you, if you've been around for a, a long enough time, you have enough words of Jesus yeah. that have come into your life to turn you into an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. You've had enough words of Jesus that have come into your life by the power of the Holy Spirit to drive off a horde of demons. You've had enough words of Jesus to cleanse you of a multitude of sins. You've had enough words of Jesus to come into your life to make you a world-renowned evangelist, to make you a saint. The question is, what's going on in your soil? If you've got ears to hear this message today, you're going to ask the Holy Spirit to show you what's going on in your soil. And some of you already are tuning out and turning off because you don't want to hear nothing about your soil You might want to hear about somebody else's soil, but not your soil. You are responsible for your soil. That's the whole message of the parable. Mm. Is that if you allow the word of God, the word of Christ, to dwell richly in your heart. See, literally, Jesus is saying in this parable Mm. that there are things that disconnect you from the word. And those things that disconnect you from the word, disconnect you from the life, disconnect you from the power, disconnect you from the love, disconnect you from the breakthrough, disconnect you from deliverance. Listen, you can cry out to God till you're blue in the face from deliverance. But if you continue to allow these things to separate you from the word, you'll never receive the deliverance that you're crying out to God for. It's only as you allow the word of Christ to dwell in your heart richly. So, in plain man's English, in 2021 English, if Jesus were to come to our church today and preach the parable of the sower in plain English, he would say it like this. There's about four types of people in this crowd right now. All of y'all fit into one of these categories. First type of people, you're hearing me, but you ain't hearing me. You ain't feeling me at all. I mean, you're just here. You've already tuned me out. You've already decided that this isn't for you. You're pretending to listen. I mean, you're kind of, it's not like you're thinking about something else. You're hearing me, but you've already made a decision before I started to speak that this word is not going to have any impact on your life. And you think it's just because you're not interested in actuality. Satan is standing at the door of your heart, snatching up every word that I'm speaking. That's your problem. And then there's others of you here. You're hearing me. You're even feeling me. You're typically, you typically have the loudest amens. You got, you're great at saying amen. Oh yeah, you love it. Mm. You're quickening. 
shaking. You're getting it. It, it seems like you're getting it. Actually, when people come to church and they look at you and, and ooh, how blessed you are and the tears streaming down your face, they think you're getting it. But as soon as you get in your car and drive out of here, all it takes is for somebody to cut you off yeah. and you flip them the bird. All it takes is a little trouble in your life. And you're asking me, how come I abandoned you? Don't, don't I love you? All it takes is for some other Christians to act a fool. And you start saying stupid stuff like, I don't think I even want to be called a Christian anymore. Like, you're willing even to disconnect yourself from my name because of what some other Christians are doing out there. Other people who call themselves Christians. Like, all it takes is a little, a little trial, a little persecution, and you forget everything I said. And I'm sitting here looking at you like, what about all that crying and that amen and you were doing last Sunday? It was just so shallow. And then there's others of you. You hear, you say amen, you cry, you receive it, you take it home, and you begin to dwell on it, and you're doing so well, and you start, you know, growing, and, and it, you know, you start growing, and everything looks great. But you get so enraptured, all you need is just a little success. As soon as you get a little bit of money, as soon as you get a new wife and some kids, as soon as you get a new job that starts taking your time, you get distracted by the things of the world. And all of a sudden, your commitments to me start to disappear. Yeah. You almost bore fruit, but you didn't. Mm. Because you allowed your heart to get distracted. But then there's a fourth group of you here. And you hear me, and you receive, and you say amen, and you cry. And some of you don't even say amen out loud, but your heart is crying out amen. I hear the amen of your heart. Some of you don't even shed any tears in your eyes, but I see that your heart is weeping. Some of you look like nothing's happening to you, but on the inside, you've not only decided to receive my word, but to hide my commands within you. And you, you go home and you cling to those words. And you meditate on those words day and night. And when trouble comes, it doesn't disconnect you from the word, but you cling to it even tighter. Yes. And when persecution comes, it doesn't disconnect you from the word, but you cling to it even tighter. And when a little success comes, it doesn't disconnect you from the word, but you cling to it a little tighter. And when a little fame comes, it doesn't disconnect you from the word. And when blessing comes, it doesn't disconnect you from the word. And when you get a husband and some children or a wife and some children, they don't disconnect you from the word. Whatever comes into your life, Instead of distracting you, it causes you to turn to me even more. Yeah. Because you're not only hearers of the word, but you cling to it. Mm. And you meditate on it day and night. Yeah. And you, you're going to bear fruit. Some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. <laughs> the least of you is going to have a 30x return uh -huh. on that investment. And some of you are going to get a 100x return, which is absolutely crazy. Yeah. Let him who has an ear, let him hear. That is the invitation. Let him who has an ear, let him hear. Mm. And when Jesus says, let him who has an ear, let him hear, we tend to hear that through the lens of Western civilization, Western civilization and through the lens of Greek philosophy. We hear it as if Jesus is saying, whoever understands it, good for you. The rest of y'all, peace out. That's not what he's saying at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What he's saying is, if you hear my voice, repent and believe the gospel. Yes. If you identify yourself in the category of the wayside, yeah. the word has been bouncing off of me. Some of you, You've heard this word for years and you yeah. still haven't responded to it. You haven't even accepted Jesus into your heart and you've heard the word for years. Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with the sower and there's nothing wrong with the seed. You yeah. simply haven't prepared your soil. If there's one message of this passage, it's that preparing your soil is your responsibility. Yeah. When Jesus says, let him who has an ear, let him hear. 
He is inviting us to turn our hearts to the Holy Spirit and say, Oh Lord, by your power and by your grace, prepare the soil of my heart. Lord, my heart has been wayside soil. My heart has been stony ground soil. My heart has been thorny soil. But I want my heart to be good ground. Remove the weeds. Remove the stones. Pull me off the path. Make the the ground of my heart good soil so that I might receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save my soul. Let's pray. Bow your heads. Precious Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would descend upon every heart and that you would awaken every soul to the invitation. Lord, you have made an announcement. The time has come. And you have given an explanation. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God, that place where you are completely free to reveal to us all of your love and all of your power and all of your glory and all of your blessing, and all of your favor, and all of your goodness, because our hearts are completely committed, completely devoted, completely surrendered, and completely enraptured with you. But now that you've made that announcement and that explanation, you're issuing your invitation. Let him who has an ear, let him hear. In another place you said, let him who is thirsty, let him come. In another place you said, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the invitation. Come into this kingdom. You can come in. You don't have to live on the outside of it. You can come in to this kingdom. And you say, how can I completely surrender my heart? How can I completely devote my heart? No, you can't. But you can turn to God. And you can ask him for the power. And that's all the disciples did. When they didn't understand, they came to Jesus and said, teach us. When they couldn't surrender, they came to Jesus and said, help us. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is not one who knows how to do these things well, but one who knows how to come to Jesus. Say, help me, Lord. Here I am. I want to live in this kingdom. Help me. Help me. Help me learn how by the Spirit to put to death the misdeeds of my body. To put to death the works of my flesh. Teach me how to be spiritually minded instead of carnally minded. Because the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. Help me. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me. That's all you need is the cry of your heart. Help me, Lord. Lord, if you don't help me, I'm lost. I want to live in this kingdom. This is what Peter said to Jesus. When he was on the boat, and when he was on the boat, Jesus told him to throw the net on the other side, and he did. There was so much fish, he couldn't carry it. And Peter said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. He thought Jesus was saying, maybe you can live up to the level of being my disciple. But Peter was saying, I know I can't live up to the level of being your disciple. I've got too much sin in my life. But Jesus said, don't be afraid, Peter. Just come and follow me. Just come and follow me. Just come and follow me. The disciples are the ones who are willing to follow Jesus into the house and ask for his help, ask for his understanding. That's all. Follow Jesus into the house. Every place in your life where there's a crooked place that needs to be made straight, the encounter with God comes when you follow Jesus, when you take the word, and when you take the word and allow it to abide in your heart. That's following Jesus. That's following Jesus. Following him is receiving the word, taking it home, meditating on the word, going into the prayer closet, asking God for understanding, seeking his face, dwelling in it, letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What's going to come out of that is great understanding. What's going to come out of that is great breakthrough and great freedom. What's going to come out of that is the word of Jesus itself is going to bring you before the face of the Father. In the Revelation, John said he looked and there was a door standing open in heaven and he heard a voice say, come up here. And this is what Jesus is crying out to us today. Come up here. I'm inviting you to come to a higher place. I'm inviting you into a deeper place. You simply got to hear my voice and respond. Father, I pray today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that this clarion call of the Spirit would resound in every heart. 
and that we would respond. Let every heart prepare him room. Let every heart prepare him room. God, free us of everything that would disconnect us from the word. Disconnect us from the stones. Disconnect us from the... Lord, deliver us from the birds. Deliver us from the stones. Deliver us from the thorns. Good soil. Good ground. That's what we desire more than anything else. We ask it in Jesus' precious holy name. Right now, I want you to respond to God in your own heart and in your own way. I'm not even going to tell you how. You just must respond to God right now. If you need personal prayer, you can just click request prayer right there in the chat and somebody will be right there to pray for you. Some of you are feeling like, I don't know how, I don't know what to do. I want to go to the next place, but I know what that is. I don't know how to get there. That's good. That's good. You're supposed to feel that. That's the very place where you fall at the mercy of Jesus. You simply have to learn how to remain at his mercy. I remember going through a season in my life where I cried out to God so deeply. There was a change that needed to happen in me and I didn't know how to make it. And I was just, just limp before the Lord. I was crying out, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm completely at your mercy. And the voice of the Lord came to me and said, then remain at my mercy. Yeah. We want to come before his mercy seat for a moment. God wants us to live there. Remain at my mercy. Meditate on the word. The word is enough. Yeah. Stop looking for what comes from the word and look for the word itself dwell on the word. Some of you need to take this message and listen to it again and again. Take notes. Whatever you don't understand, go into your prayer closet. Get your Bible out. Ask God for understanding. Sit with another believer. Bring it up in your community group. Call another believer. You need to begin to pursue. Discipleship is a pursuit of Jesus. It's not a passive waiting for Jesus to pursue you. He already pursued you. The cross was Jesus' pursuit of you. He owes you no more pursuit. And yet he continues to pursue you. He continues to be the sower. Even in this message today, Jesus the sower was being made known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's sowing his word in your heart. The question is, do you have ears to hear? Yeah. Do you have good soil? Are you going to allow Satan to disconnect you the moment the service is over? Or are you going to dwell in the word? Are you going to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly? Father, I pray today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you speak to the heart and mind of every one of these brothers and sisters of mine. Strengthen and encourage and teach us to open our ears to the voice of Jesus the sower. Lord, we know you as Savior, but now we want to know you as sower. For every day you come to sow the seeds of your word in our hearts. May our hearts be soil that is waiting and ready, plowed and ready to receive your word that we might bear much fruit I pray it in Jesus' precious, holy, mighty name. Amen. Amen and amen. If we were all here together, I'd say give God a shout of praise right now. You know what? Right in your house. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Give him a shout of praise right where you are. Begin to declare right now that you've received the word and that that word is coming to your heart and it's going to change you and that you'll never be the same again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Come on up here, wife. God bless you today. We love you with the love of Jesus Christ. You want to add anything to this? Yeah, I just want to ask the Lord to, throughout this week, God, that you would open our eyes to see the state of our soil. Yes, God. God, oftentimes, God, our eyes are upon the world. What's wrong with this world and what's going on? God, the, the news is just, just distracting us. But this week, Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to see the state of my soil, of our soil. And if in my soil, God, there's anything that keeps me from uh, continually be distracted or disconnected from the seed, the word of God, we ask that you would remove it, Lord. Open our eyes to see. You know, I'm reminded, oftentimes we always tell Aletia, Aletia, clean your room. Aletia, clean your room. And, and a lot of times she is able, but when she lets it go really bad, she's not able to. And then she comes, can you help me? Can you help me? Then as parents, we go and we help her. Right. And this week, will you look at the state of your soil hmm. and clean up? So good. Clean up, disconnect from the things that disconnects you from the word. But if you're not able, it's okay. If you're not able, look 
to your daddy and say, can you help me? God, this week, can you help me to clean up my room? Daddy, God, can you help me to clean up my soil? So good. When you do, yeah. when you ask, he will. He will. He will help you. He'll do it. Amen. Amen. We love you so much. God bless you today. May the joy of the Lord be your strength. And may the word of Christ dwell richly in your hearts as you admonish one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Mm. May the God of peace fill you with all peace as you walk in him. We love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.